Stay tuned for an interview with the creators of Busted, next on Common Sense. I'm Mike Nixon. Welcome to Common Sense. This show is dedicated to the proposition that most of what you know is wrong. In our show, Don't Be a Notch, we broadcast in its entirety the video busted which was produced by the Fletcher Rights Foundation to teach people how to protect their rights during police encounters. As a follow-up to that show, we traveled to Washington, D.C. to interview the creators of this video and to explore the work they are doing there. Steve Silverman is the founder and executive director of the Fletcher Rights Foundation. Previously, he was the campus organizer for the national campaign to repeal the federal law cutting financial aid to students reporting drug convictions. He also interned with the prestigious Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, and with the sentencing reform group Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Scott Morgan is a graduate of Guilford College where he received senior honors in the Justice and Policy Studies Department. There, he served as a student advocate for the College Judicial Board, representing students charged with substance abuse violations. Scott currently serves as Associate Director of the Fletcher Rights Foundation and, and editor of the Fletcher Rights blog. Let's go to this interview now. Steve Silverman, Scott Morgan, welcome to Common Sense. Thank you for uh, letting me come down here to uh, talk to you guys. Uh, why don't we start out first just talking about Fletcher Wright's foundation and how that, uh, how that came into existence. Okay. Um, Fletcher Wright's foundation uh, was founded in uh, 2002. Um, I'm the founder uh, and currently the executive director. And basically, uh, I founded Fletcher Wright's because I found that there is a tremendous lack of uh, information out there about how to assert your constitutional rights during police encounters and worse. I found that uh, people were generally uh, frighteningly underprepared to deal with such situations. Um, a story that was particularly, uh, I think, seminal in, in the development of this idea uh, happened uh, when I was a, a freshman at University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, I was in my freshman dorm and I got uh, a call that woke me up at, at 8 in the morning on a Saturday, which when you're a college student, is, you're generally sleeping uh, at that time. Um, but it was my, my friend Steve, not me, Steve, but a friend also named Steve, who called. He sounded very disturbed, uh, and he was a, a, at a nearby dorm, and he said, come to my dorm. Something happened last night. I want to show you something. So I said, okay. And I made my way over there. And he had a long face. Uh, he and his roommate. Uh, and I immediately noticed that the room was ransacked. It was shredded. Anything that could be dumped on the floor was dumped on the floor. Uh, he, uh, his mattress was torn open with a, with a knife, it appeared. And he had told me that uh, the police had come last night. Uh, they had been uh, smoking cannabis uh, in the dorm room. Uh, and someone had called the, the police. Nobody knows who did. Uh, but it could have been an RA because at University of Maryland they have a rule where if the RAs smell anything burning that could be marijuana or even incense which could be used to cover it up they're actually required to call the College Park Police. Mm -hmm. It's absurd and so um, the police came he opened the door when they said announced that they were police he opened the door which he probably shouldn't have done uh, he let them in um, and they said hey we know we know what you got here we know that we know where's the stuff and he said, he shouldn't have said this, but he said, 
we don't have any more. We smoked it all. <laughs> Which later appeared in the, the police report. Sure. No, no, man. We smoked it all, man. Under the line confession. Exactly. Yeah. And so they then shredded the place. They found a pipe with some resin. Um, he wound up getting arrested. Uh, he, he wound up getting kicked out of university housing. Uh, wind up having to, he was, on, he was uh, on academic probation, I believe. Um, he had to appear in court, do community service. Basically, like every institution that could take a piece out of him could. And to me, it actually, it actually upset me at the core more than it did him. Because in many ways, I, I saw that I could have easily been there, if not, if not but for the grace of God. So that was something that sort of stuck in my mind. Uh, as I then went forward and got involved with, with other activism. But years later, um, I was working with uh, the Coalition for Higher Education Act Reform, uh, which is an organization, uh, a coalition that's wor that works to repeal a law called the, the Higher, Edu Higher Education Act Drug Provision, which cuts federal financial aid to students who report drug convictions on their federal application forms. And to me, this just sounded like the height of stupidity uh, that someone would be denied access to education uh, for something in their past. And in fact, there's no other questions on the form that ask you about any criminal past except for drug offenses. It's the only one. And so I worked uh, you know, with the coalition to help repeal that. And one of my tasks was, uh, in addition to being the you know, sort of the campus organizer, was uh, to speak with uh, folks who lost their federal financial aid as a result of their, their drug conviction. So uh, we'd get calls pretty much every day from, from young people who uh, felt that they lost their financial aid. And, and, uh, and I'd always ask them to tell me about their police encounter. Tell me exactly what happened you know, when, you got, when you got stopped because this is important information for us to have if, if they're going to be media spokespeople. And so on just about every single scenario, there was a point where uh, the victim of the law at some point waived their constitutional rights and actually consented unknowingly to a police search request. And it always took me a little bit of time to narrow it down, narrow it down, and I'd say, well, so they arrested you for, for small possession of marijuana. Uh, they, did they search you? Yeah, they searched me. Well, did you let them search you? Well, I had to let them search me. They, they searched my car. I said, what did they say to you before they searched your car? They said, you know, my, you know if I, I, got, I got to take a look in your car. Tell me exactly what you remember them saying. Well, he said something like, um, you don't mind if I take a look? And I said, okay. And I said, there. I said, you didn't know it, but you consented to that search and it was automatically legal. You didn't have to do that. And I always found myself giving these 20 minute, you know, know your rights sermons on the phone. Mm -hmm. And eventually it, it dawned on me that there was just very little information about this. Uh, and it was remarkable. Um, that the only places where I was able to find such information was on some defense lawyers had websites um, the ACLU actually, you know, they have their little freedom card which sort of lays out your rights during a police encounter. Organizations like uh, National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Law had a card. I think maybe even like the Libertarian Party uh, provides, you know, uh, similar materials. But I just found that the lack of understanding and just the, the constitutional illiteracy that existed was really something that was very disturbing. And I just, you know, I talked about this stuff with friends of mine, even uh, activist colleagues, and I would tell them uh, about their right, you know, we would talk about our rights during police encounters. And so many of them actually believe, for example, that you had to consent to a search during a traffic stop. Smart friends of mine. Well-educated people. And Well-educated people had such minimal understanding of this, or just complete lack of understanding. It really dawned on me that this was important information to put out, and you know, I, I you know, built a website with this sort of compiled um, the consensus sort of general advice information that the lawyers had provided. I interviewed uh, lots of defense lawyers um, about this. I sent out questionnaires to them. You know, what what are the most common ways you know people waive their rights? You know, uh, what percentage of your your clients consent to searches? And pretty much the response I got back was everybody waives their rights. Everybody consents to searches. Everybody. 
So I knew I was, I sort of knew I was on to something people like who've this. seen the busted video. Except, well, this is before <laughs> yeah, this. This is before this. Busted, uh, right. And the only people that really uh, asserted their rights I found were, well, either, you know, police officers, lawyers, <laughs> and maybe their children, uh, who, they, who they told this valuable information to. This is really a tiny percentage of the population. Um, so from there, I actually started doing... Uh, this, this sort of had evol evolved into a role-playing sort of performance theater that I did where I actually dressed up in a full police officer's uniform. Mind you, this was before September 11th, so I was actually able to go to uh, the, uh, the uniform distribution outfit in, in Washington, D.C., uh, and I walked right in and I told him I needed a police officer's outfit because I was doing a performance art piece. And the guy sold me everything I needed. He says, oh, you're going you're gonna to need handcuffs with that, too. I said, oh, of course. Gonna, do you have a badge? Oh, please. So he, he sold me the whole outfit. Uh, and so I, I used this. I was actually this sort of caught on by word of mouth. I started traveling to universities uh, and college campuses, uh, groups like uh, Normal, National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws, you know, invited me to come out. Groups like Students for Sensible Drug Policy, you know, because they had just a direct interest in knowing their constitutional rights during police encounters, and it was able to attract uh, crowds um, to these events. And so. This is what I did, sort of officer friendly came to town and I'd have uh, volunteers come up and I would ask them, you know, I would, I would uh, persuade them to consent to searches as officer friendly and I'd find contraband on them, which is something that, you know, I planted on them with their consent beforehand. Uh, I mean, it was, all, it was an act, but ultimately when I started getting into those scenarios where I was having that conversation with that young person and saying, well, uh, if you don't have anything to hide, you don't mind if I take a look in your bag? the place would go silent. And I'd say, well, go ahead and let me take a look. And she'd open her bag and would go, no, no, don't do that. Like suddenly they knew their rights, you mm -hmm. know. And, and so it really captivated people. And I was amazed by how fascinated people were by this essentially silly sort of performance art piece. Um, and there was one moment when I was flying back from University of Ohio, uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy chapter invited me to come out and do an officer-friendly training. And I was on the airplane. And I'm just thinking, God, this is such a sort of a waste to have me traveling around to these, you know, random college towns and doing this officer-friendly uh, piece. I'm not going to try to train other officer-friendlies. I mean, God forbid I have a rogue officer-friendly giving bad information. There's really so little ability to control something like that. So I immediately thought, this is an instructional video. Like, I have all the scenarios in my own head. If this were done as a dramatic video, this could be enormously popular. Um, so we applied for uh, foundation funding from uh, the Marijuana Policy Project uh, has, has a grants program. We applied for this and we nailed it. They loved it. Um, and we got funding to do the video. I, by that point I had been looking around independent uh, documentary makers and I had discovered a gentleman named Roger Sorkin uh, who, who, who I befriended and immediately as soon as, as, soon as we got that, that check uh, I called Roger up and I said, hey, I, I work for you now. Uh, let's make this thing. And I, you know, I, I put a screenplay together you know, with his help and while, while putting together the screenplay uh, a young man named Scott Morgan uh, over here had graduated from uh, Guilford College and uh, he had um, persuaded me to, to take him on uh, as an intern. Uh, I was very impressed by his, his resume and his knowledge of constitutional law. Um, and I, I had really no intention of even bringing on an, an intern. I had really no sense of that. Um, but immediately I let him review the screenplay thinking that he would just say, oh, this is fantastic. This is really good. Wow, how can I help? No, that's not how he did it. He uh, he cut it to pieces. I mean, he really you know critiqued the thing very effectively, and I knew right then that this guy uh, knew uh, perhaps more than I did. Certainly knows more than I do about constitutional law. I mean, he really was a a real student uh, of of this, and so uh, you know we quickly became partners on this project, and so. It so was had you formed uh, the foundation when you were doing the officer friendly thing, or was that something that got formed when you uh, started to bring the video together? Um, I think at that point we were uh, 
while doing officer friendly, we were applying for our, our 501c3, you know, sure. tax exempt status from the IRS, uh, which we received in July of 2002. By then, I think we had a few officer friendly trainings under our belt, but we had not yet um, written the screenplay or, or started uh, pre-production on right. Busted at that point. Right. And and when did you do Busted? Uh, Busted was uh, filmed in uh, 2000. It was cr finished in November of 2003. Yeah, it was the fall. I believe that, year. Um, right. that and it was it was released at around around December of 2003. Well, it's been out there about three three years, and yep. we were talking before the interview how it's it kind of trickled out eventually into the internet and kind of has gone viral, as they say. Uh, exactly. I mean, we didn't we didn't have a uh, a distribution deal worked out with a major Hollywood distributor, so we we've independently distributed this through primarily through through the web uh, and through word of mouth has been the by far the most powerful vehicle it's just this is something where people who've seen it anytime they hear of a friend who's telling them about a, a nasty police encounter they have the first thing they say is watch this mm -hmm. they sit them down they get them a copy and it's just it's spread like that you know just the rule of the few we have you know just uh, you know, a few score uh, of our biggest, you know, mavens. You know, there's there are folks out there who just they make it a habit of buying dozens and dozens and dozens of these things and making them available to people who need them. Uh, defense lawyers started uh, catching wind of this. They're some of our uh, biggest distributors, um, and also through different nonprofit organizations, uh, distributed it, such as StopTheDrugWar.org, made it a membership premium, and which. Uh, has done tremendously well, bringing in you know, tens of thousands in revenue for them. Same with the Marijuana Policy Project, actually, who funded uh, the project, actually then has um, purchased, you know, at discount, um, hundreds of these and then made them available as a membership premium, brought in tens of thousands in revenue from that. So really, it, it's been a tremendous uh, success uh, on, on all those fronts. Right. And um, you were reciting some numbers earlier before we talked before this interview about kind of you have some estimates of how many people on the internet have, uh, have at least have viewed this. Well, yeah, it looks like about 1.2 million o over that now that we can prove between websites like Google Video and YouTube.com mm -hmm. and really a number of other places where it's available. And I mean, w the great thing about that, of course, is that it's a self-selected audience of people that are interested in this information. They want to know these things. And so they're going and finding it on their own in a great variety of places, and then asking, "Who's responsible for this? You know, right. who made this? Where did this come from?" And so, in many cases, the audience does come back and find us and and talk to us about it and ask more questions. And in some cases, they pick up, you know, their own DVD copies. But uh, the other thing that's fun about it is we can look at the comments out on on Google Video and YouTube and elsewhere and see what people are saying and actually get into a debate with the viewers and answer their additional questions and and learn how to better develop our materials in the future so that people you know will uh, really take the information seriously and understand that that it's a serious project All right um, one of the things I wanted to have you talk about uh, was to address some of the mis misperception about rights vis-a-vis -vis the Bill of Rights. I mean, in some of the shows I've done, I try and hammer on this. Well, I think you had a blog the other day, which was mm -hmm. on up, up front of your site, where, where uh, our esteemed Attorney General, mm -hmm. who is a lawyer, you'd think he knows knew the law, but he made a statement to Congress that because, well, relate that. I mean,